The debate over offshore fossil fuel extraction and how it squares with this country's climate ambitions was thrust back into the spotlight today. Climate activists were at the court of session in Edinburgh to try and halt the development of the Rosebank oil field off Shetland and the Jackdaw gas field off Aberdeen. If their legal challenge is successful, operators will have to resubmit environmental impact assessments for approval before drilling can begin. Supporters of the project say they are needed for ensuring the UK's energy security, but critics claim they fly in the face of net zero ambitions. We're really hoping and expecting that the Scottish courts will uphold the precedent set saying that all emissions from oil and gas projects need to be counted and will reject these oil and gas permits and tell the companies to get out of those fields now. Well, we debated the pros and cons of further oil and gas exploration with the energy specialist Alistair Thomas, who works for the strategic advisory firm True North, and Rosie Hampton, a just transition campaigner with Friends of the Earth Scotland. Alistair, campaigners think the licences were awarded under a flawed process. How do you see the situation? I think it's a difficult process for the industry to grapple with at the moment. I think it would be environmentally and economically incoherent if we didn't allow these projects to go ahead. Jackdaw will account for 6% of Britain's gas supply. It would make more sense to develop that than to import it from places like Qatar and the United States at a higher carbon footprint. And Rosebank, this is a 2,000 job project. It's £6 billion directly going to the UK supply chain. And let's not forget, Scottish GVA, 10% of that comes from uh, oil and gas. And, and I think most importantly, I'm coming to you from Aberdeen, uh, we have the highest concentration of uh, subsea companies and expertise anywhere in Europe. We're really primed for work in offshore wind and hydrogen, carbon capture and storage. The market simply isn't there yet. Um, Rosie, what is your response to that? I mean, Alistair mentions a few things, uh, how important the jobs are and the money coming to the British economy. You know, jobs are absolutely crucial to the energy transition, which is why we are totally against fields like Jackdaw and Rosebank, particularly when you look at the statistics that have couched them. So jobs supported by the oil and gas industry have halved in the last decade, despite 100 or so oil licenses granted within that time. The real secure long term jobs are in the renewables industry and it actually takes political will and investment to create those jobs and if we're chasing the you know the fragments of a dying industry by looking for jobs in a geological basin which is maturing and declining then of course we're never going to find them there I mean, what's your response to that alistair i mean we hear a lot about the just transition to green energy but how committed are the oil companies to it you know really Look, I work day and daily with companies in offshore wind, in carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, and yes, in oil and gas as well. And all of these companies are on the ground grappling with the challenges of net zero and the energy transition. They are committed, fully committed to the job of getting on with the transition. But we need to be realistic about the challenges here. It is a Herculean task. We need to unprecedented levels of offshore wind installation. We need unprecedented levels of grid capacity onshore across our landscapes install, installed. And that's before we convert our, uh, our heat pump, our, our gas boilers for heat pumps and our petrol and diesel cars for electric vehicles. It is a huge task. In the meantime, we need to have work available for this supply chain, which is, in my view, the most important national asset we have to get us to net zero. If we don't have work in the interim period, which comes from projects like Rosebank and Jackdaw, we will lose that supply chain further. And just to address that earlier point in terms of the, the, the hemorrhaging of jobs before, look, we've had two downturns in recent memory from the oil and gas sector. That's true. Part of that was due to the COVID pandemic. And I, I totally agree that it requires political will to make this transition happen. We're all committed to that end, end, end goal, but it's about getting the journey right as well. Uh, and, and Rosie, Alistair's saying we have to be realistic about how long this just transition will take. You know, we, we can't afford to turn the taps off, you know, right away. There's, there's a while before the, the renewable capacity will be there to meet our needs. You know, it's interesting that Alistair says that, given that our recent research demonstrates that 75% of North Sea oil and gas companies have no 
named commitments to invest in renewables um, until 2031. Not a penny I'm from sorry, them is incorrect. going into the Hang renewable on a second, transition. So why would we you know, listen to people telling us that they're on the same page as us when their interests clearly lie elsewhere? You know, the, the facts are there to demonstrate that the monetary commitment is not there. And also you, you talk about the COVID pandemic as a kind of crisis point. Well, who was the first to face the brunt of that? It wasn't profits. It was workers when a third of the workforce lost their jobs overnight. So, you know, we're, we're looking at a completely different set of interests when it comes to the energy transition. And really, it should be the workers and communities who we've done countless numbers of work with over the years at Friends of the Earth Scotland and Platform to listen to their demands for the energy transition. And they're telling us that they want to move to renewables and they do move from rigs to offshore wind farms fairly regularly, they're just seeing industry-made barriers to do so. So really, we need to be serious about yeah. who is actually committed to the transition and who isn't. Alison, you seem to disagree with what Rosie was suggesting at the, the, at the beginning of our answer there. What, you come back on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we have numerous examples and we are seeing renewables investment already. To give you a few of them, Total Energies, the French energy major, has invested in Seagreen, which is Scotland's largest offshore wind farm. In fact, many of the North Sea producers operating right now are awardees in the recent Scotwind offshore licensing round. We have BP right here in Aberdeen investing in a green hydrogen hub. We have Harbour Energy, the North Sea's largest producer, developing the Viking carbon capture and storage project in the Humber. To suggest that there isn't investment going on is, is simply incorrect. What I would say is, you know, if we want to see more investment, we can't have a picture whereby companies are taxed for windfall profits, which simply do not exist. There is no longer any sort of windfall going on. And it's a difficult environment for them to be investing in when this kind of conditions are in place. Uh, Rosie, so you heard Alice saying there that these companies are committed committed uh, to renewable energies. I mean, what was your resp You didn't actually answer my question when I said, when would you want the taps to be turned off? So I think to just come back on a couple of points on the investment figures there, um, carbon capture and storage as an example is not a renewable technology. It is a greenwashing tactic in which oil and gas production and fossil fuel production is allowed to continue. And they attach this technology, which has not been proven at scale anywhere, okay supposedly bring the emissions back up. And in terms of your question around fossil fuels and when we would like to see that end, we are looking for a fair and just transition that has workers at the heart of it dictating the terms and the conditions that they move into. But how long before we make that transition? So we follow the Tyndall Centre report, which you know takes into account the historical pollution that you know countries have each taken, which for Scotland is significantly higher than countries in the global south. And it looks at our capacity to transition. So it takes into account the resources we have and okay. the infrastructure. And experts have estimated that that production date would put us at ending fossil fuels in 2000, oh. um, 2031, So, which is a more than achievable date with the political ambition and investment to realise that. Alistair, so very, briefly, very, briefly, very, Alistair, very briefly, your response to that date. 2031, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't see a credible path to that. We had the, the Aberdeen Grampian Chamber of Commerce survey just last okay. week uh, looking at the energy transition reports. Um, in terms of offshore wind work by the year okay. 2030, okay. companies believe that will account for just 8% of business here. Okay. If we shut it down prematurely, it's, there's no viable path to just transition and, and support for the workers being referred to there. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. But thank you both very much indeed uh, for joining us on Scotland tonight. Thank you.